afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon. Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon, and welcome to the latest episode of our sports show. As you know, we've been preparing all up all go all coming this month for the upcoming premiere of our global rugby legends, a feature where we speak to prominent names in rural rugby from countries of Scotland, Wales, England, Ireland, South Africa, Australia, and France. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by our guest. One of the greats of Scottish rugby, a Grand Slam winner in the 90s, and probably one of the revered Scottish rugby sides of all time. Uh, the great uh, Scott Hastings, obviously a world renowned name in terms of rugby, in terms of Northern Hemisphere, and brother of uh, another great as well, Gavin uh, Hastings. Uh, Scott, first of all, uh, starting up for you growing up in the world of rugby was. Rugby, the only option for you growing up as a child, were you prominent in other areas in sport and track and field, maybe soccer, football, or was it rugby, rugby, rugby in your household? Yeah, Jim, there was um, there was uh, actually three bro- three brothers, uh, four of us in the Hastings household. I've got three brothers. Uh, obviously, the Hastings brothers are synonymous with myself and Gavin, uh, mm-hmm. and of course, we've got my nephew Adam playing at the moment down in Gloucester and back in the Scotland squad. But no, um, I have an elder brother, Graham, who lives in Australia, and a younger brother, Ewan. But being brought up in the Hastings household, it, it didn't matter what time of the year. Um, you know, if, if it was in the middle of the Five Nations, the rugby ball was out. When it got to cup finals in soccer, the football was out. If it got to Wimbledon, the tennis rackets were out. When it, the athletics was going on, we were having races in the garden. And, of course, we used to get my old man's lawnmower out And uh, when the test matches were on at cricket, we'd mow the lawn, we'd paint the crease in the wicket. And and for me, sport was always synonymous with with our family, no matter what happened. But undoubtedly, the the ripple or the theme or the thread throughout, there was was always uh, rugby was there. And and golf wasn't far behind either. And uh, but, you know, we used to laugh around the dining room table, the kitchen table, and, and just talk sport all the time. In fact, my mum tried to stop banning us from talking about rugby all the time. Um, so we would talk about golf. So she banned golf and we then talk about rugby. So, but listen, it was it was great fun. There was happy times in the Hastings household. And, and for me, sitting around a kitchen table is where the best conversations always happen. And Scott, uh, in terms of academics, were you academically bright? Could you have gone on to a prominent uh, career in other areas or from a young age when rugby sort of took off for yourself and Gavin? Was it that very much the, the goal, that the centred aim for you personally? Well, of course, when, when, when Gavin and I first you know, appeared on the international scene in 1986, the game was totally amateur then. So there was, mm. there was no payment in the game. And indeed, Gavin played all his career during the amateur era, I got about a year and a half at the back end of the Rugby World Cup in 1995. But um, I was more, you talk about academia, I was more of a creative guy. And I, I uh, used to love advertising, graphic design. I actually worked for an advertising agency for many, many years. I've always been fascinated by marketing and, 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 and design in terms of the way we approach our design. In fact, my, uh, my son is a designer. He took on the the good genes there and and he's into innovation and experiential design where I was more into sort of graphic design and occasionally I'll still pick up a pencil and draw a little bit but you know for me it was always those creative routes and as I said I ended up working in an advertising agency having studied a course in, down in Newcastle as a student in business studies and graphic design so that was almost my interest and, and I suppose You know, academia, of course, you know, we studied hard, worked hard, played hard. Um, And, you know, not everything sunk in at at times, but rugby was always the outlet. Sport was always the outlet. And, you know, in in many respects, my, my, um, my whole career is surrounded by sport that I love. And to this day, I'm still commentating on the game. I, I I do a bit of public speaking. Um, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy the flexibility of my life. And it's given me a lot of good stuff working in, in sports and sponsorship, event management, hospitality. And, you know, I, I could look back with a lot of pride in everything that I'm doing. For your family, obviously a joyous occasion, January the 17th, 1986, the two brothers make their debut for the, for the country on the same day against France. Uh, 
have you any memories of that sort of day within the Hastings household with you, were yourself and Gavin did you speak to your family much or were you very much a touch were you very much interaction between each other and Gavin yeah. as the older brother did he sort of keep you in line did he say listen <laughs> I was um, I was living home at home at the time, and uh, I just actually started the job in the advertising agency a month before it was my twenty first birthday, so it was all new to me. And uh, Gavin was down at the time, I think, uh, down playing rugby for uh, Cambridge University, or just had graduated from there. So he was down in London at the time, and we uh, we we got on so well together, and undoubtedly it was a proud moment for the family and. You know, everybody rallied round, and it was a really special occasion. Um, I, I used to play fly half and full back um, in in all my sort of junior days, but it, there was some guy called Gavin Hastings playing at full back, so I had to slot in somewhere. So my my third game of playing centre um, was for Scotland, would you believe, against a certain guy called Philippe Sella, who went on to <laughs> win over hundred caps for. Uh, 100 caps for France. I think he was winning his 42nd cap there. So I was up against an experienced operator, but I enjoyed playing centre. And um, I had my club mate alongside me on the right. That, that was David Johnson, who was an electric centre. And inside me was John Rutherford, uh, a fantastic fly half for Scotland and the British and Irish Lions. So the fact that I was alongside my brother Gavin made it incredibly special. But there was also four other new caps that day. The Scotland selectors had recognised there was a there was a bit of a sea change going on in the game. The, the 1984 Grand Slam team hadn't performed well in 85. There were six changes uh, in that 86 team. So it was a massive vote of confidence by the selectors to go into that season. And of course, the old Five Nations Championship, we won that day against France on debut. I think Gavin slotted six penalties and we had a hell of a party after that. But also we used to meet up on a Sunday in a local uh, tavern called the Golf Inn uh, or the Golf Tavern, I should say, in in Edinburgh. And uh, so the celebrations lasted uh, all weekend. I'm glad to say we got off to a good win, 1817 uh, against uh, France. And, you know, the rest is history. We tied the championship that year, year actually. And... Uh, but it was a marvellous baptism of fire. And, you know, international rugby was still the sort of uh, sort of Corinthian days of Bill McLaren commentating on the BBC. There was something magical about the Five Nations Championship that I'd been brought up with. And, you know, for me, they were very special days. Yeah. And I suppose, Scott, I mentioned this to uh, Craig Chalmers. Uh, I was talking to Craig about it. Throughout the late 80s into the early 90s, Scotland was going through a golden age in rugby. Probably the most prolific Scotland where obviously you've done the Grand Slam in 1990. You've famous battles against the English side. It was almost yourself in England for tone and throne for each sort of uh, four, five nations as of an known then sort of tournament then. But in terms of that, did you feel ye overachieved or underachieved? Because Craig felt maybe that you underachieved and he mentioned that Rugby World Cup, Rugby World Cup 1991 in terms of that semi-final and felt that maybe he left it behind it as of such a team littered with so many great Scottish players. Did you feel yourselves that you, you achieved greatness winning that Grand Slam and getting to Rugby World Cup semi-final? I, I think the fact that Scotland have only won three Grand Slams, I think um, for, for, Craig's absolutely right. We wanted more. We were very driven. Um, the, the, uh, the Grand Slam team of 1984 had spurred the team on in 1985, 1986, and into the first Rugby World Cup in 1987. And I suppose 1990s, the team built their confidence and a few of us became more senior players and got confident playing in that arena. We did want more. Um, and yeah, we can look back now and go 1991, a semi-final Rugby World Cup. Yeah, on paper, yeah, it, you could say it was successful. Uh, but ultimately, we didn't achieve our ultimate goal, and that was to win the Rugby World Cup. That was probably the best chance that Scotland will ever have in terms of lifting, you know, a major international trophy. Um, even in 1990, uh, we had a fantastic tour down to uh, New Zealand where New Zealand had remained unbeaten from that 87 Rugby World Cup win. And uh, we lost a test series down there and the second test at Auckland is one that still greats to this day where we've been 18-12 up with uh, 20 minutes to go. 
um, and we lost 21 points to 18 in Eden Park and we should have beaten the All Blacks. And I think Craig's absolutely right. We look back at that and, and to this day, it still hurts that we didn't achieve. And, and as, as the game sort of grew, not only in prestige, um, but the team evolved. And you fast forward a few years later to 1995 and the Rugby World Cup in South Africa, which was just the most glorious celebration. We had a real chance to get through to the latter stages. Unfortunately, due to a loss against France in the group stages, it put us on course um, to play New Zealand in the quarterfinals. And whilst we made a good fist of it, the simple fact is if we'd gone down another part of the route, another side of the draw, we may well have ended up in the final. And, 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 and therefore, the frustration, I think, uh, was that we were a good team. We, we were very, very committed. And, um, you know, we did have some great, great ding-dongs with England, with France, who, who brought out a lot of great rugby against us. And, you know, it was just unfortunate that we just didn't quite fulfil those the, the ambitions, I think, that we all had for the game. Mm. And Scott, in terms of you, everyone sort of remembers that tackle on Rory Underwood uh, underneath the sort of post uh, in terms of that that Grand Slam, in terms of trying to st- in terms of the stopping uh, England uh, being sort of victorious. Uh, obviously, yourself in England went through some great battles throughout it. They were littered with Jeremy Guscott, Rory Underwood, Will Carling, Rob Andrew, to name a few. Uh, did you almost feel like it was blow for blow in terms of what she had in your back row as well, yourself and Gavin going up? Did you study much about England every time you played them? Uh, or- or back then, was there the technology to do that sort of research? Or just we, 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 we did, Jim. And, and when I first got involved in the international team, there was a guy called uh, um, uh, Grant, who was uh, the, the coach at the time. And he brought in Ian McGeechan. And, um, you know, that, 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 uh, that combination worked really well, of course, laterally into the Grand Slam uh, year. Derek Grant, by the way, was uh, the guy's name, and ex-Scotland and British Lion himself. Um, but then McGeehan took on that role alongside Jim Telfer. Scotland were fabulously coached in, in, in the early 90s, and it was really down to Ian McGeehan and his uh, unique analysis um, of the game. He would pour over old videotapes of the opposition, paint the picture he would actually... Um, record his own tapes and he would show them to us about how teams would try and attack, uh, you know, within the game. So the analysis was starting to come through. And we also knew and had confidence within our attack platforms, our, our roles as players, our understanding for each other. We were very much in tune with each other and the bedrock of that game plan of a fast, rucking, hard game uh, based on quality kicking, Superb backup was the foundations of our game in the early 90s. So McGeechan and Telfer kind of took that, that whole style of rugby on. Uh, and, and whilst, you know, we, we perhaps probably kicked and relied on our back row a lot, it suited, it suited our game. And, and we, we, we found a fast, fluid style that, that we could manage and manipulate opposition. But, you know, you mentioned England there. That, you know, the, the likes of, you know, I came across um, a, the likes of Jeremy Guskett, uh, Will Carlin. They were a fantastic centre combination. You mentioned Rory Underwood. Uh, you know, up front, they had a magnificent hooker, um, you know, in, in Brian Moore. And, you know, who, who used to be the, one of the most antagonistic guys around within the game. And then, you know, in the back row, you had some amazing players such as Peter Winterbottom, for example, and uh, Mike Teague, who was an outstanding man. And, you know, it was really, you know, there was there was some real, you know, Paul Atford, you know, the, the mighty Wade Dooley. You know, England had great, 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 you know, pack of forwards. And, you know, there was a great rivalry because obviously Scotland, England being in the Calcutta Cup is the biggest and, and the longest ever rugby international ever played uh, between two international teams. So that rivalry was amazing. But the one thing, Jim, you've not sort of touched upon is that we got to know a lot of these players on the Lions tour in 89 and 93, where sudden, suddenly the rivalries became friendships and the understanding that we had real passion for the game meant that, that those rivalries you know, continued on the pitch, but the friendships to this day 
continue off the pitch. And for me, they were very special times as the game moved from that amateur level into professionalism. So the fact that we were scratching the surface early days in the 90s with the analysis, the fact that our fitness improved, the nutritionists came on board. And literally when the game went open just after 1995, um, you know, the game had to move on because it was attracting huge crowds, huge sponsorship, huge profile for the players. And 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 for me, you know, looking looking back, I think we played in a fantastic era. Uh, Scott, so many players have played uh, for their countries down through the years, uh, represented England, uh, Ireland, uh, Wales, Scotland to a plum. But only a elite select few get to be a, get the honour to call themselves a lion. In terms of your own career, that happened for you. Uh, you appeared for the British Lions. Uh, do you feel your career would have been unfulfilled if you hadn't appeared for a line or if you hadn't been a British Irish line? Was that something for you that was something that you can say? Did you appreciate it as much as at the time or when you look back afterwards, you say to yourself, wow, that's something I wouldn't swap the world for in terms of no. being a British Irish line? No, I, I would never underestimate what it meant to pull on that jersey, to pull on that badge, to represent you know, the uh, the combination of the best players of the four home unions. And that wasn't lost upon us. And, you know, I mentioned there about Ian McGeechan. Um, well, he was synonymous as a Lions coach. And, you know, with him and Roger Utley at the four, Clive Rollins was the uh, the manager, ex-Welsh coach, um, ex-British and Irish Lion himself, who was the manager of the 1989 tour down to, uh, down to Australia. Um we knew we had an opportunity to sort of step into the unknown. And it was the first, you know, the, the tour was eight, eight and a bit weeks long. Um, it was just an incredible experience. And I think something that we've, we will never forget. And in the days now that we've got fly in the wall documentaries, we've got social media, mobile phones, cameras and everything, our memories of 89 remain hours and hours only. Mm-hmm. And although there'll be the odd photograph from inside a winning changing room, um, as players, we can look at each other in the eye and think that was really special. And 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 for us, we just kind of joined that sort of conveyor belt of, of, of other Lions tours from 71, 74, and the famous names, you know, such as Willie John McBride and Gareth Edwards and Barry John. It was just marvellous to be a Lion. And, 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 and playing that red jersey, which is absolutely unique. And yes, you know, in 1993, I went back to New Zealand and was part of a tour there. I was injured just before the first test and had to return. Um, but it was equally special to go to New Zealand and be a line down there. But, but recently, the Lions Committee have bestowed such an honour on all Lions players by awarding them these beautiful ceremonial caps by understanding our uniqueness and standing within the game. And, and for me, that's what makes being part of the Lions to a very, very special, um, that we can look back with a lot of pride that, you know, we achieved something pretty special. Um, and playing in a winning Lions Test series alongside not only my brother Gavin, but some great players of the era, um, you know, brought a lot of uh, pride and pleasure and passion um, to everything I continue to do in this life. Mm. On that note, finally, Scott Hastings, if you look in the mirror and you have to describe Scott Hastings as a rugby player, an East Pomp, uh, how would you describe him in two sentences? In two sentences? Just a good guy who was highly passionate for the game. And uh, for me, it was always about enjoyment, and it still is. Yeah, and still very passionate to this day. Scott Hastings, uh, 65 caps for Scotland, 43 pints. Uh, we didn't get to mention, uh, obviously played for Watsonians uh, Rugby uh, Football Club as well. 226 appearances, a whopping 500 pints as well. Uh, synonymous British and Irish Lions in 1989 and 1993 as well. And when he retired, the most Scottish, most retired, the most Scottish rugby cap player ever. Uh, a synonymous feat uh, in terms of that but Scott Hastings an absolute pleasure talking to you today sir and we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Jim thanks very much and, and good luck and I hope all your viewers have enjoyed the chat across the podcast it's been a pleasure speaking to you thank you for your enthusiasm and uh, yeah it's good to look back every now and again and remember folks the older we get 
the better we were. Yes, yeah, that's true. Go down to Cheers, Scott. Okay, Jim. Good.